Hi, right, today I'm going to be talking about my fascination and um, the allure that objects have on me, um, that I get associated with certain objects and kind of obsessive about them. Um, for instance, the most recent edition is this. This is my dad's old lead-filled x-ray dental suit. He was he was getting he was getting a, a new suit, um, so this one so he gave me the old one, um, not on his own accord. I asked for it for weeks, obviously, every single day, whether the new one shipped in because I really wanted it. Um, I am going to be playing with some X-rays downstairs with his old machines that he's getting rid of as well. But I I think that why I really like this is the weight it has on me. I'm not going to wear it now. It's kind of funny, but. I actually like lying down and having this weight on me. And apparently this is common for a lot of the people on the autism spectrum. And they have, you could even buy weighted blankets, blankets that are filled with grain that uh, that are heavy. And it supposedly calms uh, the kid down if they're having a tantrum or, or whatever it is. But it's just, you can also get for adults too. Um, and then of course Temple Grandin has her infamous squeeze machine, which is kind of like a cattle shoot deal that she could control. Um, uh, she'll lie face down in it and two panels will squeeze her from the side. She says it's very common, calming. So autistic people, they don't like, I mean, in, in some cases, light, light touch is very aversive for them, but deep pressure isn't, and it's somewhat soothing. Um, my theory is that, um, since your body boundaries, uh, some autistic people have uh, body boundary is issues, the proprioceptive issues. So I feel like when you're stimulating, you know, um, like the deep pressure um, sensors in your skin, it kind of outlines your body a little more and kind of grounds you maybe a little more concretely in the world. Anyway, going off on a tangent, but very exciting. Um, I'm going to go over a funny story uh, just about I, I mentioned it in the ADHD video, but it's worth mentioning. So basically in grade six, the first day of class, I was in English and the teacher said, the best student is going to get this pen. This, it, this is, it's this pen. It's a boxing happy face pen. So. The best student in the class will get this pen. And so she puts it in a drawer and she closes it. And of course I look at the drawer and I'm just staring at it and I'm gonna remember that drawer. Um, so the year goes on and of course I'm thinking about the pen every day, um, how great it's gonna be when I have the pen, how my room is gonna look with the pen located in it, how I'm gonna play with it, what it feels like, what it looks like, what it smells like. So I really just, I hype myself up to this crazy degree and I just like, I picture, like I basically have like an elute, like I basically have like a mental concept of a pen that's very, very tangible, but of course it's not nearly as tangible as actually having the pen, so I obsess about it. So the year goes on and I've learned to not tell anybody about my object obsessions because I really do end up pissing them off. I ask repeatedly over and over again. Um, and eventually just turns into the only thing that I could think about or the only thing that uh, that I would talk about with that person would just be can't wait for this, can't wait for this pen. Um, so I learned to always kind of keep keep those those um, keep those things to myself. Uh, but as the end of the year went on, I mean this is this was a full a full school year, so she probably doesn't have the pen at the forefront of, of her mind. Um, so at the end of the school year when the class was let out, you know, I was sitting there in my seats, like, you know, like sit, like I was counting down the days till the till the last day of school when she's gonna get the pen, and I wish, you know, I hope, I hope that that I would get the pen. Uh, but the last day of that class, before I moved on to the the next class, uh, she didn't mention the pen at all. Um, you know, like goodbye, students. It was nice knowing you. Uh, have a great summer, kind of deal. Uh, so I was really pissed. Um, I didn't say anything. Because I, I knew I didn't say, I, I didn't want to say anything because if I go up and make a big deal out of it, people are going to hear about me wanting the pen and maybe they're going to want it. 
I, I was old. I, you know, grade six is, is maybe a little, a little too old to be obsessing about objects, but I still do it now, and I always will. Uh, so I wasn't. Uh, maybe I'm immature in that sense, but but anyway. So as the day well, as the day went on, and we were officially released from the last class of the day of the last day of school. Uh, you know, I was leaving with my bag, uh, ready to step outside, but of course I stop by that teacher's class and she's packing stuff away for the summer. So I go up to her and I say, you know, you, you showed us a pen at the beginning of the year. Can I have, can I have that pen? And she doesn't remember where, you know, she doesn't remember the pen. I said, it's a happy face boxing pen. And and she still doesn't recall it. It's in. I say it's in that. It's in that drawer over there. It's in the back of that drawer, over over there. So if you could open that drawer and take the pen out and give it to me, I would be happy. Um, and you know, she opens the the, the drawer and she looks at it and she says, mm, "I don't. I don't know. You weren't the best student in the class. You know, I was going to give this to my grandson, and I was." In my head is bullshit. I'm getting that pen. I'm not leaving this classroom until I have that freaking pen. Um, it doesn't even have, it doesn't even have, even have ink in it. But what, whatever. It was, it was perfect, and I needed it. Uh, so I mean, I don't really know how the interaction went exactly, but I walk out of the class with a pen, and you know, I don't. I probably didn't even say have a good summer. It's just like, okay, screw off. You're just the vehicle who I'm attaining the pen from. Um, thank you very much. Uh, you know, great, I have a pen. I was, I was thrilled, you know. It was like the ultimate prize. Of course, I wasn't the best student in class, but nevertheless, it, it's a good It's a good example of, of just to what extent I'll go to, um, to keep, you know, certain memories in my mind to keep up um, uh, certain certain obsessions and to, and to carry them out. Uh, it's a very, very strong pull for me. Um, it's very, very loud. Um, it tends to smother other p definite priorities. Um, so it's not good uh, in that sense. Um, there, there's another story about uh, about a kid with a, with a watch that he showed me one day. Um, and from that point on, he was watch kid. I wasn't even friends with him, but... I would just be asking him about the watch and if I could have it. I always ask that if can I have it? Could I have it? I didn't. I didn't have a sense of ownership, right? That that's his, and he might not want to part with it, or that person may not want to part with it. But I asked anyway. Could I have that? Could I have that? I, I needed those objects. Um, so yeah. So he was, you know, watch kid basically. So I wasn't really friends with him, but he was the kid who had a watch, and I wanted the watch. Uh, so in that class, I was also distracted with that with Watch Kid, and uh, I, I ended up not getting it. Um, so I mean that, that was one case. There, there was another case uh, with kids with a with a with a calculator that you pressed a button and it was spring loaded and it would flip open. And he said he was going to get it for the class. Uh, he forgot about it a couple of days after, and I got a whole bunch for the class because I kept on reminding him. So anyway, so that that's all positive. That's all just me wanting objects and making that happen. The downside to it is, I guess when I was younger, objects were something predictable. Predictable, sorry. They didn't move. They didn't change. You know, they, they, they were they were a, a constant. Um, There's something I can wrap my head around. Whereas people were ambiguous and you know changing all the time. Um, so what I did when I was younger was I attached an emotional tag to that object based on who bought it for me. So, you know, if my grandmother, if my grandmother uh, buys me a toy, you know, I'll look at it and, you know, that's how I'll connect to my grandmother. I'll say, uh, it's like she can, t it's like her spirit is in there, you know, because, because her buying me that toy was uh, a moment in time. It, it's, it's frozen in that toy. And I really would imagine which shelf was it on at the at the toy store? How did it look? How much did it cost? Um, you know, like the, the layout of the, of the toy store, and you know what her intention was. You know, oh, my grandson is going to love this. You know, so I would, that moment would be kind of captured inside inside that object, and that that was kind of how I that was kind of a catharsis 
because I would randomly start crying while thinking about this because I didn't connect to many people in, in, in the physical way, you know, like my emotions weren't tied up with the actual person. They were tied up with this kind of tangible, frozen moment in time that I could analyze and hold constant in my head. And that is just gonna, you know, gonna be the symbol of that person's love for me. And so I would feel an intense emotion while looking at that toy knowing they purchased it. And I would often cry. It would be a, it would be a very, very strange, bittersweet sensation, like, like I wanted to cry, like that was my emotional venue or, or release. Um, so it's very, very, very strange, uh, very strange things. Um, one side effect or negative effect of that is what happens if that object breaks. Then I used to flip. Having a broken object was tantrum-worthy material. Um, I was bitter and angry and furious and frustrated when something broke. Uh, even if you superglued it, uh, whatever it is, you know, if it's a toy and it broke in half and you superglued it, that crack in the middle, now it's not going to be as pure as the real toy. And I'm, it's like I'm, I'm going to mourn for that toy. I'm going to mourn for that memory that was captured in that toy. It losing losing something I liked or something that was broken. It was basically like losing a finger for me. Um, I remember anyway, and, and it was difficult because I was in a situation where I often lost them because I used to bring them around with me all the time. For instance, there was a teddy bear pendant. I must have been two or three, and um, I was playing. I was probably three. I was playing in uh, one of those uh, you know big tower sets where you can go through tunnels and there's a ball pit and whatever it was so i put the teddy bear pendant uh like over here on on my t-shirt and i needed it i needed it right by my side that's who i was going to share to share the experience going with you know i i i like that was going to be my buddy that was going through the thing with and i was going to give him bring him on a ride through the stuff so that, that, you know, that was in my head. So there's already an attachment there that, you know, I wanted to bring it. And of course, I was in the ball pit. Um, I looked down and it was gone. And I was just a terror. I was throwing, digging through this whole ball pit with the kids and just screaming at them, like, through, like moving them aside. It was like digging, digging, digging. Like I need to, you know, and it's, it's you know, a couple of feet. And you know, the chances of finding something tiny are very slim. So... And I, you know, I come outside, I go to my parents, and I'm just screaming. I'm just tears of rage. And, and you know, and they're like, well, I told you, you, should, you shouldn't have gone in with that. And that just made it worse. Um, anyway, so, yeah. There was another, oh, there, there was another one where uh, we were doing poster presentations. And... One, uh, it, it was um, career day, so you know, so you were made poster presentations on someone you job shadows. Generally, when you're that young, it's some of your, it's you know, it's your parents. So one of uh, the parents of a kid did um, was a, um, a heart doctor. <laughs> he did, he he did, he did, he no, he he was he was a surgeon. He did, he did open heart surgeries. Um, so what he used was this kind of catheter thing that could go inside and it's, it's ablation. You could, you could uh, select certain cells and zap them that are causing uh, some arrhythmias. So he had this long catheter thing, but it was really cool because you controlled the direction of the catheter and the tip would like tilt and go in whatever direction of your remote control. So he pasted this thing right on his you know, right on, right on his presentation board. And as soon as I saw it, I said, I need to ask him if I could have that. Um, I was thrilled because all the boards got put to the back of the class so everyone could see after. So every single day, invariably, I would go up to his board and even though it was glued on, I would just twist the knob and watch the thing move up and down. As soon as I got into class, got into class, drop my bag, go to that thing, play with it, you know, Jonathan, can you please you know, sit down? Okay, fine, I'll sit down. 
And so at the end of the day, I asked him, um, you know, could I have that? Could I have that? And, and he says, okay, let me ask my dad. And he asked his dad and, and he comes back the day after. He says, no, no, it would be, it would be dirty. And I knew he was totally bullshitting me. No, it's not going to be dirty. Obviously your dad didn't use this in open heart surgery. You also wouldn't be pasted against a board. It'd be in like biohazard bin. So I was, I was angry. <laughs> You know, so, you know, so I, I understand how I, how I could have been bullied and generally was a nuisance uh, to people, uh, repeatedly asking them for things. Um, but, I don't know, that's always a part of me, so, obviously it's much, much less so right now, but uh, still happens. I still get uh, object fascinations and uh, um, all of my special interests uh, arise from... A fascination with a certain object and then I expand from there you know how, how things work like I was fascinated with tea kettles and then um, I uh, so one of the sometimes a switch in a tea kettle will contain nitinol wire a wire that once you heat up it'll snap into another position so I got obsessed with nitinol wire and then so I looked up where do you get nitinol wire and sometimes when you have braces the wire uh, that they put in between the brackets on your teeth is nitinol wire. So I couldn't wait for next time I got a braces adjustment. So I went to the, you know, I went to the, um, I went to the dentist there, and he had a full cart of, of uh, wires that he took out and he replaced it there. So I asked him for a couple. Um, of course, not all of them are nitinol. So I do some research online, knowing which brands of retainer wire. Uh, or uh, braces wire contain the nitinol so for the next time for the next three week later appointment I could ask him for some nitinol wire you know and then from nitinol wire I, I looked online and I came to rare earth magnets so you could see how, how these things kind of they're like nodes and they spread and attach to other things and so object obsessions are good for me they they lead me to having a thirst for for knowledge um, and and probably will you know will you know f f f help me in a f in a future career, um, you know that, that that's kind of that's kind of what I, what I want to do. I'd be surrounded by by stuff I I love and can't stop thinking about, and yeah. So that's about it. Um, thanks to Tony for uh, suggesting the topic of this video, and I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching.